Has there ever been a screen goddess with a story filled with more tragedy, comedy, and mystery than that of Jane Mansfield? Let's take a look into the dramatic and daring life of one of Hollywood's greatest sex symbols. Mansfield was often viewed as merely a low-end replacement for Marilyn Monroe. And like Monroe, she met a tragic end. On June 29th, 1967, at about 2 a.m., Mansfield was in a car with her three children, including the future actress Mariska Hargitay, when they collided with a semi-truck on a dark Louisiana highway. The crash tragically killed the adults in the front seat. But miraculously, the children sleeping in the back survived. Following the accident, the media circulated sensational stories, including claims of satanic curses. They also characterized her as a washed up, outdated figure and an alcoholic. However, there was much more depth to Jane than these portrayals suggested. Far from the stereotypical dumb blonde, Mansfield was fully aware of her image and willingly played the part. She was a highly intelligent woman who wasn't afraid to push boundaries to achieve the fame she knew she was destined for. From an early age, Jane was determined to make it big. And she did, cementing herself in the pop culture scene of the 1950s as one of the original blonde bombshells. But she was an accomplished dramatic actress and a naturally gifted comedian, talents that are sometimes overlooked. Mansfield's eye-popping physical appearance and fondness for attention-grabbing antics often overshadowed her genuine ability. She had an IQ measuring a voluptuous 163. She was fluent in five languages, a lover of art history, and a skilled musician. So how did this almost cartoon-like figure end up dying in such a tragic and violent manner? This is the real-life story of Jane Mansfield. Born Vera Jane Palmer in 1933, Mansfield's early life was one of happiness and familiar warmth. From the outset, Jane shared a special bond with her father. She was his cherished daddy's darling. She fondly recalled, my earliest memories are the best. I always try to remember the good times when daddy was alive. When Jane was just three, her father suffered a fatal heart attack. Jane explained her memory of it. We were driving up a steep hill. We were all laughing and joking. Mama had a funny story about a dinner party that night. Suddenly our laughter stopped. Daddy fell over against Mama. He was dead, just like that. My daddy was gone. She added, it started to rain, washing away over her tears. The rain has haunted me all my life. While her father's death didn't drastically alter young Vera Jane's daily life, his absence left a void. Something went out of my life, she said, but life went on. Many believe that Jane spent the rest of her life seeking to reclaim that lost something. Jane's father was only 33 at the time of his death in the mid 1930s. He had been declared fit and healthy by his doctor earlier that very day. He had every reason to feel content with a loving family, a thriving law practice, and potential political aspirations. His death was a devastating blow to the young family. In 1939, Mansfield's mother remarried, leading the family to relocate to Dallas. Mansfield, growing up, would sing songs by her idol, Shirley Temple, and start to explore the arts, ballet, painting, violin, and piano. She experienced her first movie at age six, she remembered the effect it had on her. I came home and imitated the stars. I knew I was going to be a movie star someday. Jane didn't like living in Texas. She believed that a career in movies could be her escape from a dull life. But it was soon evident she would have anything but a dull life. At barely 10 years old, her mother had to buy her her first bra, which Jane disliked but she was developing physically at a pace that far outstripped her peers. 
By the time she was a teenager, attention from boys was virtually omnipresent. At just 16, still in high school, Vera Jane Palmer eloped with Paul Mansfield, who was 20 years old. She kept their marriage a secret, continuing her high school education and staying with her mother and stepfather. But when she got pregnant, the truth surfaced. Mama said I had ruined my life and her life, Jane confided to her friend and biographer, May Mann. Mama said I made my bed and I would have to lie in it and to expect no help from her. Then she relented and bought me a pretty white wedding dress and we had a wedding of sorts. But I always remembered her telling me never to expect help from her. On November 9th, 1950, Jane and Paul welcomed their daughter, Jane Marie. However, becoming a mother did not halt Jane's drive and determination to succeed. Following her graduation from high school, Jane and her husband enrolled at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. As with many young couples, they faced financial challenges, juggling parenthood, classes, and various jobs. They worked hard to provide for themselves and their baby daughter. Jane explained, Paul and I had a rough time. I peddled photo albums door to door, and he took odd jobs, swept floors, and sold magazines. Many times I would have to take Jane Marie to classes with me. During a summer when Paul was away at Army ROTC camp, Jane left their daughter with her parents and traveled to California. There she pursued drama studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. After the summer session, the Mansfields briefly returned to Texas. Jane took acting classes with Baruch Lumet, father of renowned director Sidney Lumet. It was Baruch who later helped her secure a screen test at Paramount in 1954. However, with the onset of the Korean War, Paul was called to active duty in the Army Reserve, leading to a relocation to Camp Gordon near Atlanta, Georgia. Jane's fondness for sunbathing and energetic outdoor activities attracted considerable attention from the soldiers and their wives, much to the annoyance and jealousy of her husband. Paul Mansfield struck an agreement with his wife. If she could endure his two-year military service, they would then move to Hollywood to pursue Jane's acting dreams. Initially supportive, Paul moved with Jane and their daughter to Los Angeles. However, as Jane's career ambitions intensified, Paul began to resent the idea of her becoming a star, feeling increasingly sidelined in her life. Jane was already strategically plotting her career moves with precision. In the 1950s, the epitome of womanhood in the public eye was, of course, the curvaceous platinum blonde, a standard set by Marilyn Monroe. Nature had blessed Jane Mansfield with a 40, 22, 35 figure and a touch of hair bleach would complete her transformation into a mid-century sex symbol. Jane Mansfield embraced the blonde bombshell persona, dialing it up to 11. Her new persona sometimes crossed the bounds of what was considered acceptable back in the cautious 1950s. She decided to test the boundaries at local beauty contests. Jane entered and won the local round of the Miss California contest but upon discovering this, Paul insisted she withdraw from the competition. Unfazed, Jane went on to win nearly 30 beauty pageants in the following years. She held some fairly unconventional titles, like Miss Texas Tomato and Miss Fire Prevention Week, though she reportedly declined the title of Miss Roquefort Cheese, quipping that it didn't sound right. Despite her success in the pageant scene, her physical appearance proved a bit too bold for commercial advertising. Recalling one of Manfield's early modeling jobs, photographer Gary Lester explained a shoot for General Electric. Jane was one of the girls I used. She was way over to the left side of the picture. General Electric informed me that they had to remove her from the picture because she appeared too sexy for 1954 viewers. Jane Mansfield's pursuit of fame ultimately led to the end of her first marriage. Just four months after moving to California, Jane and Paul Mansfield separated. Tensions had already been surfacing during their time at Camp Gordon. Paul had hoped marriage and motherhood would dampen Jane's ambition. By the time Paul was deployed to Korea, 
Your marriage was essentially over. I knew it, Jane remarked, and I think Paul did too. But you don't walk out on your husband while he's off fighting a war. At least I don't. The Mansfield's marriage crumbled under the weight of emotional and financial challenges after their move to California, and including Jane's relentless drive for fame. Upon his return in 1954, they settled in a modest apartment in Van Nuys, Los Angeles, with Jane's collection of pets, including a Great Dane, three cats, two chihuahuas, a pink-dyed poodle, and a rabbit. Disagreements around Jane's career ambitions, infidelity, and her considerable array of pet animals were the main cause of arguments. Eventually, Paul issued an ultimatum, her career or him. Not long after, he returned to Dallas. Still in her early 20s, Jane was resolute about making it in Hollywood. According to showbiz lore, she boldly called Paramount Pictures, declaring, my name's Jane Mansfield, and I want to be a movie star. In 1954, this audacity, with a little help from Baruch Lumet, led to a screen test invitation. The studio had her perform a scene from Joan of Arc, of all things, but her betrayal didn't exactly impress the executives. Playing a medieval saint with a 40-inch bust proved somewhat incongruous, and no contract followed. However, Mansfield's efforts paid off when she secured her first film role in the 1955 noir, Female Jungle. The same year saw her debut in Hugh Hefner's sensational new magazine, Playboy, with a semi-nude spread. These photos gave Paul Mansfield, looking for ammunition in a custody battle, grounds to claim Jane was an unfit mother. This accusation was repeated by her subsequent husbands, though it was never substantiated in court. Jane knew the importance of good publicity and enlisted the help of Jim Byron, a former club promoter, for image management. Byron secured her a meeting with the producer at Warner Brothers. Having heard countless tests from aspiring actresses, the producer suggested Mansfield might be better off as a wife and mother. After a studio tour, he told her he'd call if an opportunity arose. It didn't sound promising, but shortly after, Mansfield was invited for a screen test and quickly signed a seven-year contract with the studio. Casting director Milton Lewis advised her to focus on her natural strengths rather than drama. The studio decided to complete her transformation into the next Marilyn Monroe, starting with dyeing her hair platinum blonde. Mansfield later said, he lightened my hair and tightened my dresses, and this is the result. By the mid-1950s, Marilyn Monroe was challenging the studios for greater control over her roles and her life. As Marilyn increasingly resisted the studio's dominance, they began searching for a new, more compliant, blonde bombshell. They hoped to find someone who wouldn't resist their control, and Jane was eager to step into this role. She saw her chance to shine on the big screen. Jane wasn't one to sit around waiting for the studios to get her name in the headlines. She developed a talent for devising publicity stunts that landed her in the tabloids. I feel that there's a time and place for everything, she said. Whether it was a strategically loosened spaghetti strap that broke at the perfect moment in front of cameras, or giving Sophia Loren an unforgettable view, or even her top conveniently coming off in a pool, surrounded by photographers at a press event for a movie she wasn't even part of. The camera couldn't take its lens off of Mansfield, not even for a moment. A journalist of the era commented that she had so many on-stage wardrobe malfunctions that nudity seemed to be a professional hazard. Her wardrobe designer reportedly parted ways with her, concerned that these frequent mishaps reflected poorly on the quality of his work. Long before Janet Jackson's 2004 Super Bowl incident, Jane Mansfield was at the forefront of wardrobe malfunctions. Her most iconic moment happened in 1957, where an iconic photograph caught her figuratively and literally overshadowing Sophia Loren at a party, welcoming the Italian actress to Hollywood. Recalling the event in 2014, Loren told Entertainment Weekly, I'm so frightened that everything in her dress is going to blow. Boom and spill all over the table. Jane unabashedly used her sexuality to capture attention at a time when doing so 
could put a woman's entire career at risk. She set herself apart from the other starlets who typically played it coy and reserved. She proclaimed, sex appeal is a wonderful, warm, womanly, healthy feeling. Jane was aware of her allure and made sure everyone else was too. Her readiness to do anything for fame led some to view her as a forerunner to modern reality TV and social media celebrities. But she was always aware of what she was doing. There's not much to the part, she once said, but the pay is spectacular. I feel that a star owes it to her public to bring the public into her life. They feel the fans feel that they kind of own you. And if you kept your life a complete secret, it wouldn't be fair to them. She relished walking the Warner lot alongside Hollywood's biggest stars, and the studio's publicity machine kept her in the spotlight. However, her seven-year contract yielded limited opportunities, leading Warner Brothers to part ways with her after four unremarkable films. Her breakthrough came not in Hollywood, but on Broadway, in the play Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter, where she portrayed the vapid blonde sex symbol Rita Marlowe. This character was a clear parody of Marilyn Monroe, who had starred in another play by the same playwright just a year earlier. The play became a massive hit, allowing Mansfield to express her comedic talents and proving her ability to cleverly craft her playful bombshell image for maximum impact. After Warner Brothers dropped her in 1955 for her Broadway pursuits, she landed a deal with 20th Century Fox in 1956. The studio bought the play's rights and offered Mansfield a six-year contract, aiming to develop her as a leading star. In that same year, she appeared in The Girl Can't Help It, which earned critical acclaim and was a box office hit. Mansfield played Jerry Jordan, a tone-deaf mobster's girlfriend, pushed into singing stardom by a beleaguered press agent. The film, featuring stars like Eddie Cochran and Little Richard, was a major success reinforcing Mansfield's glamorous image. Fox started to promote her as Marilyn Monroe king-sized, unlike Monroe, who grew to resent her public persona and yearned for serious roles, Mansfield thrived in the spotlight. When Monroe's conflicts with Fox led to her suspension, Mansfield stepped in as the studio's new leading lady. George Axelrod once noted, Jane Mansfield loved being Marilyn whereas Marilyn hated being Marilyn. It seemed inevitable that these two powerful women would eventually encounter one another, and they did at the New York premiere of The Rose Tattoo in 1955. These photographs captured Jane trying to interact with Marilyn, who noticeably ignored her. Some might see Jane seeking a photo op at Marilyn's expense, but Marilyn's blatant disregard seemed both tactless and embarrassing. Jane idolized Marilyn, and the sight would not be forgotten. Marilyn once claimed, I've never been in a Hollywood fight or feud. I have the most wonderful memory for forgetting things. This attitude was born after she was forced to face Joan Crawford's campaign of catty jabs when she first found fame. And it is true that Monroe seldom spoke ill of fellow stars, yet she felt uneasy about younger actresses, particularly blondes. This insecurity was evident in her only public meeting with Jane. In response, Jane took a bold step. She reportedly had affairs with both Kennedy brothers, allegedly sometimes right after Marilyn's own liaisons with them. Eager to shake off her image as just another superficial blonde bombshell, Jane aimed for a change in her next project, expressing her desire for a shift. She said, I feel that my figure has been publicized much more than my intellect, and I would like to change that. She chose a serious role in the 1957 adaptation of John Steinbeck's The Wayward Bus as Camille. The film had modest financial success, but it showcased Jane's genuine acting chops, earning her the Golden Globe for New Star of the Year. That same year, she starred alongside Cary Grant in Kiss Them For Me, and revisited her role as Rita Marlowe in the movie version of Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter? Fox seized the opportunity to promote their new leading lady. They organized a North American tour, followed by a 40-day visit to 16 European countries. During the London premiere of the film, titled Oh for a Man in the UK, 
She even had the opportunity to meet an unlikely new friend, Queen Elizabeth II. Finally achieving worldwide fame, Mansfield indulged in a variety of luxury items, all in her favorite color, pink. This period also saw her acquisition of the iconic Pink Palace. The Pink Palace was located at 10,100 Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. It was once a truly unique and wildly kitsch piece of Hollywood glitz, with its heart-shaped pool, a bedroom blanketed in pink shag carpet, and an office with shiny red leather walls. The stairway displayed the many magazine covers that had featured its owner. The three-story house was variously described as Spanish colonial and somewhat mockingly as Mediterranean movie star Baroque. A fan of pink since childhood, Mansfield enlisted Glenn Hulse, a Los Angeles set decorator, to transform the house into her dream home. Originally white, she had painted it pink with crushed rock mixed in, making it glitter in the sunlight. Her initials adorned the wrought iron gates. The pink palace was vast, spanning 10,000 square feet with 15 rooms, some reports say up to 40, and seven bathrooms across three and a half acres. Heart motifs were everywhere, from fireplaces to decor. The master bedroom was a pink haven, featuring a heart-mirrored headboard and cupid-painted walls. In the living room, deep amethyst couches with heart-quilting patterns sat on plush white shag carpets. This room was also home to her chihuahuas, an ocelot, and her Pekingese named Powder Puff. The decor included cupid statues, a white and gold Stenway grand piano embellished with yet more cupids, and a champagne dispensing cupid fountain. In February 1958, Jane headlined the Striptease Review, the Tropicana Holiday, at the Tropicana Las Vegas, co-starring with new love Mickey Hargitay and produced by Monty Proser. The show was initially set for a four-week run, but extended to eight due to its popularity. Mansfield earned $25,000 per week, which is equivalent to $254,000 in 2024. She earned this rate as Trixie Tavoon, a significant leap from her $2,500 weekly earnings from 20th Century Fox. She had a million dollar insurance policy with Lloyds of London to cover any accidents during Hargitay's act. This was specifically referring to an act in which Hargitay spent a leopard print bikini clad Jane around his waist multiple times. Her wardrobe for these performances also included a gold mesh dress adorned with sequins, strategically placed to cover her nipples. The dress was described as a few sequins and Jane Mansfield. Around the same time, Jane received divorce papers from Paul, the official end of a tumultuous marriage already long dead. Jane chose to retain Mansfield as her professional surname. After the divorce, Paul remarried and moved into public relations in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He struggled in custody battles over their daughter, Jane Marie, and failed to restrict her international travels with her mother. Following her 18th birthday, Jane Marie expressed frustration over not receiving her inheritance from the Mansfield estate and having no contact with her father since her mother's death. Jane Mansfield met Mickey Hargitay, her future second husband, at the Latin Quarter nightclub in New York City on May 13, 1956. Hargitay, a performer in May West show, was also an actor and bodybuilder, having won the Mr. Universe title in 1955. Mansfield was instantly smitten, but her advances were met with fury from a jealous West. During the dispute, Mr. California, Chuck Krauser, assaulted Hargitay and was later arrested, released on a $300 bond. Following her 40-day tour of Europe, Hargitay proposed to Mansfield on November 6, 1957, with a $5,000 10-carat diamond ring. They married on January 13, 1958, at the Wayfarer's Chapel in Rancho Palos Verdes, California, shortly after her divorce from Paul was finalized. The glass chapel allowed for easy public and media viewing of the event. Mansfield donned a pink sequined wedding gown with a 30-yard flounce of pink tulle and celebrated with pink champagne at the reception. Hargitay made his first film appearance with Mansfield in Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter. They appeared on television, including Bob Hope specials, and had several business ventures like the Hargitay Exercise Equipment Company 
and Jane Mansfield Productions. Together they co-wrote Jane Mansfield's Wild Wild World, an autobiographical book that included 32 pages of black and white film photographs on glossy paper. Sadly, despite her knack for grabbing headlines, Mansfield's career couldn't maintain its momentum for long. Her rapid ascent peaked with the 1958 release of The Sheriff of Fractured Jaw, which was her last significant mainstream success. However, it was followed by a series of flops, partly due to her taking breaks for pregnancies and partly because audiences seemed to lose interest in her blonde bombshell persona. By the early 1960s, the demand for her particular brand of glamour had waned, and the excessive publicity started to backfire, relegating her to a has-been status in the box office. Nonetheless, she remained a celebrity, drawing large crowds internationally with her nightclub acts. Fox began to see her less as a leading Hollywood star and more as a candidate for foreign productions, lending her and her image to projects in England and Italy until her contract ended in 1962. Mansfeld, a classically trained pianist and violinist, continued to perform musically in film soundtracks, on stage and in nightclubs. She released singles and albums in various languages, including German and Italian. Many of her English, Italian films remain obscure, with some even considered lost. In 1959, Fox cast her in two UK-shot independent gangster films, The Challenge and Too Hot to Handle, which were released the next year. Both were low-budget, and their American releases were delayed. Too Hot to Handle, retitled Playgirl After Dark, wasn't released in the US until 1961. The Challenge came out in 1963 as it takes a thief. In the US, censors balked at a scene in Too Hot to Handle, where Mansfield in a silver netting with sequins over her nipples appeared almost nude. During this time, her marriage to Hargitay was also faltering. In 1962, Mansfield's affair with Enrico Bomba, the Italian producer of her film Panic Button, made headlines. Hargitay blamed Bomba for their marital troubles. The following year, she entered another high-profile relationship with singer Nelson Sardelli, declaring intentions to marry him once her divorce from Hargitay was complete. The couple finalized their divorce in Juarez, Mexico in May 1963, with Sardelli by Mansfield's side for the legal process. She had initially filed for divorce in May 1962, but expressed hopes of reconciliation to the press. The divorce proceedings turned bitter, with Mansfield accusing Hargitay of kidnapping one of their children to leverage a better financial settlement. After the divorce, Mansfield discovered she was pregnant. Concerned about the stigma of being an unwed mother and its impact on her career, she and Hargitay claimed they were still married. Their daughter, Mariska Hargitay, was born on January 23, 1964, post-divorce but before it was legally recognized in California. Mansfield later sued to validate the Juarez divorce, which was officially acknowledged on August 26, 1964. Hargitay remarried in 1968 to airline stewardess Ellen Siano and took custody of his children after Mansfield's death. He then sued Mansfield's estate for over $275,000 to support the children, whom he and Ellen would raise, but he lost the lawsuit. Mansfield once apologized to Hargitay on a TV talk show for the troubles she caused him. Meanwhile, Jane was adapting to the new decade and its risque zeitgeist. Tommy Noonan convinced Mansfield to become the first well-known American actress to appear nude in a lead role. This would be for the 1963 film Promises, Promises. Playboy featured nude photos of her from the set in its June 1963 edition leading to obscenity charges against Hugh Hefner in Chicago. The film was banned in Cleveland, but was a box office hit in other places. Thanks to the film, Mansfield made it onto the top 10 list of box office draws for that year. Following Promises, Promises, she was selected to replace the late Marilyn Monroe in Kiss Me Stupid, a romantic comedy with Dean Martin. However, she declined due to her pregnancy with Mariska and Kim Novak took the role. In the same year, she was featured in the pinup book, Jane Mansfield for President, The White House or Bust, 
photographed by David Addy and promoted on billboards. Mansfield later got involved with Matt Simber, whose real name was Thomas Vitale Ottaviano, an Italian-born director, after he directed her in a bus stop stage production in Yonkers, New York. She married Simber on September 24, 1964, in Muleje, Baja, California, Sur, Mexico. The couple separated on July 11, 1965, and started divorce proceedings a year later. Simber managed her career during their marriage, steering her to accept increasingly low quality and cheap projects. In 1966, Mansfield landed a role in Single Room Furnished, directed by Simber. The film was a departure for her, requiring her to play three distinct characters in a dramatic setting. Although it had a limited release in 1966, the film didn't see a full release until 1968, nearly a year after her death. The marriage started falling apart due to Mansfield's alcohol issues, public affairs, and her admission to Simber that she had only been happy with her former lover, Nelson Sardelli. After wrapping up Single Room Furnished, Mansfield joined the cast of the Las Vegas Hillbillies, a low-budget comedy to Woolner Brothers, starring alongside Marnie Van Doren and country singer Ferlin Husky. It was her first foray into country and Western cinema. She embarked on a 29-day promotional tour across major U.S. cities with Husky and other country musicians. However, prior to filming, Mansfield declared she wouldn't share any screen time with the drive-in's answer to Marilyn Monroe, referring to Van Duren. Although their characters appeared in the same scene, they filmed separately, with the footage edited together later on. During this time, Mansfield increasingly turned to drugs, alcohol, and diet pills for psychological support. She also began a relationship with her divorce lawyer, Sam Brody. Despite being married, Brody pursued Mansfield, lavishing her with gifts. However, their relationship had a troubling side, as Brody was controlling, paranoid, and abusive. 1966 also saw another significant man enter Mansfield's life. During a trip to San Francisco, Mansfield met Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. LaVey, known for his black-painted Victorian house and eccentric costumes featuring plastic horns and a cape, didn't fit the traditional definition of a Satanist. His Church of Satan, established in 1966, didn't worship the devil or subscribe to the Christian or Islamic views of Satan. Instead, LaVey was an emblematic figure promoting individualism, pleasure, and self-preservation, taking his inspiration from horror films, the occult, and 19th century individualist philosophy. He started the Church of Satan Incorporated, the flair for public relations. LaVey symbolized the 1960s ethos of self-enlightenment. Mansfield, often judged for his sexuality, found a resonance in his message of authenticity. Their acquaintance began during her visit to the 1966 San Francisco Film Festival. The pair were seen together at La Scala restaurant in downtown LA and at Mansfield's Pink Palace beside her heart-shaped pool. Photos exist of LaVey conducting satanic rituals with Mansfield on tiger skin rugs. But Mansfield, a self-professed Catholic, told reporters she didn't believe in his church. She did, however, find him to be a genius and an interesting person. Their common ground lay in their insatiable hunger for publicity and their self-aware, humorous public images, which played with societal taboos surrounding sexuality and self-expression, and not to mention their shared appreciation of eccentric decor. Brody quickly grew jealous of the rapport between LaVey and Mansfield, especially as she went deeper into Satanism. His suspicions about a romantic involvement between the two weren't baseless. Their relationship fired off a chain of events that have since become legendary in both occult and Hollywood circles. The story goes that during a visit to LaVey's Black House, where Brody insisted on joining Mansfield, he picked up a candle from LaVey's altar and dismissed it as silly. LaVey, offended, firmly told Brody not to touch anything on the altar. In response, Brody mockingly asked, are you going to put a curse on me? LaVey retorted with an ominous warning. 
You'd be well advised not to ridicule powers you're hopelessly incapable of understanding. Lave also got involved when Mansfield's son, Zoltan, was mauled by a lion at a local amusement park. In November of 1966, Jane and her three youngest children were at Jungle Land in Thousand Oaks on a publicity stunt for the zoo involving a supposedly tame lion. However, Jane looked on in horror as a lion attacked Zoltan, causing serious injuries to the six-year-old boy after biting him on the head. Zoltan was rushed to Conejo Valley Hospital where he fell into a coma, and the doctors believed he would not survive. Lave performed a mountaintop ritual with church members to save the boy. Miraculously, Zoltan recovered from his critical condition, leading Mansfield to express her eternal gratitude to Lave, believing the ritual to have been the catalyst for Zoltan's sudden recovery. Although Mansfield's dynamic personality sometimes overwhelmed Lave, they shared a genuine affection. Mansfield saw Lave as her protector, her sorcerer on call, as he put it. Lave identified Brody as a negative influence in Mansfield's life. Brody, increasingly aggressive, threatened Lave over the phone, vowing to expose him as a fraud. Lave, fed up with Brody's antagonism, performed a destruction ritual against him in January 1967 as recounted by Blanche Barton, LaVey's later wife and subsequent head of the Church of Satan. During the ritual, LaVey called upon infernal beings and burned Brody's name, declaring that Brody would be dead within a year. In the following months, Brody was involved in two car accidents, the second of which resulted in a broken leg. Despite these incidents, LaVey's curse seemed to miss its fatal mark. Moreover, Mansfield's teenage daughter, Jane Marie, filed battery charges against both Brody and her mother, leading to her seeking protective custody. This legal action clearly didn't help Brody's efforts to maintain the legal bond between Mansfield and her children, which was supposed to be his main role in her life after all. In the early morning of June 19, 1967, LaVey was up in the dead of night working at his desk, as he often did. He was clipping a German newspaper article featuring photos of him laying flowers at Marilyn Monroe's grave. LaVey and Monroe had also a brief but amiable romantic relationship when Monroe was working as a stripper in the late 1940s. While doing this, he noticed on the back of one of the photos was an image of Mansfield. Without realizing it, he had cut through the picture in such a way that it appeared her head was severed from her body. LaVey was shaken by this coincidence. At the same time, Around 2 a.m. on US 90, heading to New Orleans, Mansfield, Brody, and her three youngest children, Sultan, Mickey, and Mariska, were traveling with a friend, Ronnie Harrison. Mansfield was set to make a television appearance in New Orleans later that day. The driver, Harrison, was going too fast in foggy conditions and crashed into the back of a slow-moving tanker truck, partly hidden by the mosquito pesticide it was spraying. The car slid under the truck, and the upper part was horrifyingly crushed. Mansfield, Brody, and Harrison, who were in the front, died instantly. The children, seated lower in the back, miraculously survived without serious harm. The media went into overdrive when news of the crash broke, speculation running rampant about the nature of Jane Mansfield's death. The release of photos from the accident scene only intensified these rumors. A large, blonde wig thrown from the car gave the impression that Mansfield had been decapitated. Police reports, however, painted a different, yet still gruesomely tragic picture. The report noted that the upper portion of the white female's head was severed. Her death certificate clarified that she suffered a crushed skull and partial separation of her cranium, more akin to scalping than complete decapitation. Despite this, the beheading myth persisted, even being referenced in David Cronenberg's 1996 movie, Crash, based on J.G. Ballard's novel. The film explored the theme of celebrities like Mansfield and James Dean meeting their end in car accidents, a commentary on the erotic fascination of seeing gods and goddesses crushed by out-of-control machines. Speculation soon arose linking the accident to LaVey's supposed curse 
questions were raised about whether the curse meant for Brody had inadvertently led to Mansfield's death as well. Jane's tragic accident also led to changes in road safety laws. The fatal collision, which occurred when her car slid under a semi-truck, prompted the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to mandate a design change for all semi-trucks. They required the installation of steel bars, now known as Mansfield bars, to prevent cars from going under trucks in a crash. This change aimed to prevent similar tragedies from occurring in the future. One of Jane's children, who survived the heartbreaking car accident, followed in her footsteps to become a notable Hollywood figure, albeit on a different path. Jane's fourth child, Mariska Hargitay, of Law and Order fame, was born in 1964. Her birth came after her parents, Jane and Mickey Hargitay, had separated, but before their divorce was finalized. Mariska was just three years old when she lost her mother, and has openly discussed how the loss still affects her. It created a hole in my life that won't ever be filled. I will never get over it. I will always be a girl who lost her mom. Like her mother, Mariska was crowned Miss Beverly Hills USA in 1982, and was a fourth runner-up in the Miss California USA pageant in 1983. She studied acting at UCLA and worked in smaller Hollywood roles before striking gold, with her role as Detective Olivia in Law and Order Special Victims Unit in 1999, a role that she continues to play. In 2013, Mariska received a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, right next to her mother's. At the unveiling, she said, beautiful, beautiful symbol of the two of us together, my mother's star and mine, forever in this very special place. Jane is often remembered for her sensational tabloid presence or the myths surrounding her death. However, her legacy is richer and more human. Her daughter explained, I love hearing stories of when people met her and they always have such lovely things to say about her. She was funny and beautiful and caring and that means a lot to me. She was a smart, determined woman who worked hard for her dreams and her family I have five beautiful children that I have brought up myself. I've been the sole support of all five. Jane Mansfield established herself as a star in her own right, not just a Marilyn Monroe clone. As for the Pink Palace, after Mansfield's death, it became home to several celebrities, including Ringo Starr of the Beatles, who reportedly observed, even though I kept painting the walls white, the pink kept finding its way through, and it was also the home of Cass Elliot of the Mamas and Papas. Engelbert Humperdinck bought the house in 1976 and sold it in 2002. The Pink Palace was sadly demolished that year, yet it remains a memorable part of Hollywood's history and a tribute to the bombshell queen herself. Jane's greatest regret would be not growing old with her children, her son Tony said. But I can also tell you that she never really left. She lets her presence be known, and it's so Jane. I hope you enjoyed this look at the enigmatic and wild life of Jane Mansfield, a true screen goddess. If you would like more rainy tales from the dark side of Tinseltown, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, it's good night from Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams.